seems like a good place to start. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining tonight's webinar, Filtered Through the Lens of a Camera. I am Jen Woodside, a Director in Alumni Relations, and we're really pleased so many of you have watched these webinars in the past and continue to log in for these online programs. Please watch our website, your inbox, our social media, and we'll have a lot of updates about upcoming programs that are going to be happening through the next few months. We are joined today by Dan Bromberg, who is an Associate Professor of Public Administration in the Carsey School of Public Policy and the Department of Political Science at UNH. He is the Director of Academic Programs for the Carsey School, and his interests include, his research interests include government procurement, performance management, and organizational accountability. He earned his undergraduate degree in Korea from the University of Albany, um, an MPA from UVM, and then holds a PhD from the School of Public Affairs and Administration at Rutgers. He is joined by Etienne Charbonneau, who is the, Canadian, is the Canada Research Chair in Comparative Public Management. We're going to see how I do with this. At École Nationale d'Administration Publique in Montreal, Canada. His research focuses on citizen satisfaction, accountability, and electronic surveillance. He earned his bachelor and master's degree from the University of Laval and holds a PhD from the School of Public Affairs and Administration at Rutgers as well. So I took four years of French and I feel like I did okay there getting through that. So <laughs> thank you for bearing with me. Um, so we are going to have questions and answer periods throughout the webinar. So please just look at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a Q&A box where you can put in a question. Um, there might be a time that we don't have time for all of them. So just take note of that and it will come up later in the webinar. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters. Thanks. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Jen. Much appreciated. And thank you to all of you for uh, joining us today. We hope that the, the topic is interesting to everyone and it engages everyone. I um, mean, as Jen said, please feel free to throw out questions throughout the presentation. Uh, we'll do our best to answer those questions throughout. Um, so just to give you some uh, framing and some reference, uh, what we're sharing with you today is part of a, a larger uh, book project that Etienne and I are, are working on. Um, so we, we kind of grabbed some, some snips from that project uh, to present and share with you all. Um, we, we, we talk about uh, body-worn cameras as a tool for accountability. We talk about trust a little bit. Um, and we're looking at this both from a police chief's perspective and from citizen perspective. So our goal with this bigger project really was to think about body-worn cameras and, and their relationship to accountability. Um, You'll see a little bit of that in here. Um, we, don't, we don't get too far into the weeds though. Uh, so hopefully we keep it at a level that, that is uh, interesting and compelling for everyone. Um, so once again, feel free to jump in with questions and we will uh, we'll get going. So as we rethink 21st century policing, we have to make changes that can increase transparency and accountability to make everyone safe. So this was said by US Congressman Greg Stanton who was the former mayor of Phoenix, and he was one of the sponsors of the COPS Accountability Act. Uh, and this was in reference to the nationwide implementation of body-worn cameras. So these two words here, transparency and accountability, really imply quite a bit. Um, and they put a lot of weight into what body-worn cameras are you know, presumed to be able to do. Um, and, and we question that. You know, our, our, our research, not only this research, but previous research, we really want to dig into uh, whether or not body-worn cameras can fulfill that goal, right? So do body-worn cameras achieve this goal, this very lofty goal uh, as we see it? And we just want to kind of give you guys a, a lay of the land. So on the left-hand side there, you see current laws applicable to body-worn cameras. And that's just things that were already on the books, laws that were already on the books. And on the right-hand side, you see laws specific to body-worn cameras. Uh, this is a dashboard that's available through the Urban Institute. Um, you know, we didn't, it's not live right now, but if you were to go to the Urban Institute and check this out, you could scroll over any of these boxes here, uh, and it will take you to direct links 
to pending legislation, various rules that affect body-worn cameras. Um, but I think, you know, most importantly from our perspective is there is a lot of variation. Uh, there's really not much consistency across the board here. You see it a, a little bit here and there, but overall there's a lot of variation. And the reason that is, is because local jurisdictions, both states and municipalities and cities, are frequently making the rules as to how body-worn cameras are implemented. And it's within those jurisdictions and within that discretion that's often held by a police chief or possibly a judge um, or potentially a governor's office, right? That, that we see all of this variation and to fulfill that calling for transparency and accountability, um, it's really challenging to do uh, on a national level when all of this variation is taking place at the state level. So what did we do? So Etienne and I sent out three surveys. Two of them were experimental designs and we'll talk about them. And one of them was a qualitative design. We surveyed police chiefs. We surveyed US residents in Seattle, Charlotte, Los Angeles, and nationwide. And we did a qualitative uh, survey of police chiefs nationwide. And I'll kind of get into those details and Etienne will jump in and Etienne, feel free to jump in when, whenever you'd like and I'll, I'll stop. Yeah, so just if you go back one, one slide. Um, so why are these three cities? Because these are the cities that in all, like in the academic literature, in the practitioner literature, in police magazines, all the time, these are the three examples that come on and on, and sometimes in the same breath, sometimes in the same paragraph, they say, these are the three kind of models that, that we have, and we'll, we'll get into them, but Seattle, it's a model that is pretty transparent, as you know, as pretty much as transparent as they come when it comes to, to big cities, where it doesn't take time, video, like body-worn cameras, they film something, they will share it, uh, it's not that long. Los Angeles is a bit longer, like sometimes 45 days to eventually, uh, uh, this is the limit to, to see the, the footage. And because it's Hollywood, they will edit it nicely. They will stop the action. You have a narrator explaining right now, the officer is doing such and such because you know the guidelines, they will explain it away. And Charlotte, well, Charlotte is on the other end of the spectrum. And usually it's, uh, presented as quite opaque, not quite as transparent as other cities in, in the US. Yeah, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit as we get closer to uh, the, the citizen research that we did. Um, but they are your prototypical examples of the various extremes of, of, policy re uh, of, of the policy implementation. So first, this police chief survey. So we sent the survey to over 6,000 police chiefs, uh, received about a 10% uh, usable responses, received a little bit more than that in responses, a little over a thousand um, responses. But uh, once we kind of did a few checks, we wanted to make sure that they actually completed the experiment properly. Um, we landed with about uh, 700, give or take. The Chiefs received one or two videos of a police encounter with the use of lethal, lethal force. So these were, ch these were training videos shot in Canada. Uh, no one was injured in the shooting of these videos. We are, no going to, no, we are going to share these with you. Um, so that's just fair warning. We're going we're gonna to share both of those videos so you can see what we shared with the police chiefs. Uh, there's no sound associated with them. They're both about a minute each. Uh, the second video you'll see is a little shaky. Uh, that was just in uh, downloading it uh, to my PC. Uh, the original video wasn't, wasn't shaky. So you don't need to think about that as, as part of this. Um, so let, let me share those videos with you now. So the first one is the body-worn camera video.
and that is where that that video ends. And the second one, yeah, it's, is, usually, uh, not that, it's usually not that blockish. There's something with the rhythm, like the police chief. This is something much more fluid. I don't know. I think it's maybe it's too much. I, I, I think in the so download, it just uh, got yeah. a little shaky. Um, and this one is a little shaky too, as I said. Um, but the police chiefs did receive a bit more of a crisper uh, video. So this is from the smartphone capture. So you receive, you, you're able to see both views there. So now keep in mind, police chiefs, half of them received both of those videos, half of them only received the body-worn camera video. The chiefs also received a framing paragraph, and I'll just let you all read this yourself. It's a relatively long paragraph. I, I won't read it to you. So the idea with this paragraph was to take a chief outside of their own policy decision-making world and have them give some advice to a colleague. Uh, and this type of stuff happens regularly, right? There are working groups where stuff like this happens. Um, so our goal here was to, was to have a colleague give advice. Should I release this video or not? And this was given to the police chiefs that only received the body-worn camera video. That was all they received. However, there was a second set, like we said, that received this framing paragraph. And the only difference here is that bolded and underlined section. So in this case, the chiefs received the body-worn camera video, but they also received the smartphone video. And it was noted that the smartphone video was already circulating throughout the public, right? So local media outlets had already had this, this smartphone video. So one important point to keep in mind here is that police chiefs no longer had control over whether or not they would release the video. They no longer held that power to release or not to release the footage. Whereas in the first scenario, they still held that control. We then asked the chiefs, what would you most likely suggest your colleague do with the video footage? I would not recommend releasing the footage. I would recommend releasing the raw footage of the encounter immediately. I would recommend releasing the raw footage of the encounter to the public once an internal investigation is over. I would recommend releasing a stylized version of the footage of the encounter where a police officer narrates what is going on. And that's um, reminiscent of, of LAPD, which Etienne had just mentioned earlier, as far as how LAPD does this. All of these really do uh, demonstrate the different policy options, right? So I would not recommend releasing the footage is, is really what we see in North Carolina pretty frequently. Uh, you ultimately need a court order, typically, to get a, a video released. Um, whereas Seattle tends to rec uh, release the raw footage pretty immediately. And then a whole bunch of departments have internal investigations first. 
So I'm kind of curious, and Jen, if anyone is jumping in, I'm kind of curious what, what you all think the police chief would have responded. Um, so if, if you don't mind putting in your, your answers in your Q&A, um, if anyone wants to throw in some answers as far as what do you think the police chief recommended here? Where do you think most of them landed? And I'm assuming, Jim, we're getting such a flood of responses that uh, it's going to be the hard to The result will be known out. in three days once they're okay. counted. Yeah, oh, they're coming in. Yeah. So most of them are don't release. Um, some are released after the internal is over. And there is a few that are saying recommend releasing the raw footage once an investigation is over. Great, yeah. awesome, thank you. Um, so keep those in mind, right? Keep those in mind for what you thought the police chief should do. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of go back to that uh, towards the end of the, the presentation as well. So this is what our police chief said. And, and, and what you here, see here, go ahead, Etienne. Yeah, so just to keep in mind, so there's, we're always, present two sets of results. One for the police chiefs that saw that the only version of the events were the ones they had, the body weren't cameras. This is the, the dark column there. And the lighter gray, these are the ones that had the foot, their own footage, but there's already that foot, you know, that, that uh, the other one, the smartphone one running around on the media. So there's already another version right now. It's a question of putting their own version there or not. Uh, and because there, these two versions, police chiefs were assigned to them at random by, by you know, luck of the draw, we can deduce if there's a big enough difference that the difference in their preferences is due because that second you know, uh, version already exists. So we can kind of narrow down the effect of you no longer have total control of the footage you know, documenting the, the encounter. And ultimately, we didn't really find this difference. That Etienne's talking about. Differences so, are rather go ahead. small. Yeah, yeah the differences, differences are, are, are relatively small. small. They're not statistically significant. So that that control, that experiment, did not demonstrate that there'd be any differences. However, this was kind of only part of what we were looking at. We were actually more interested in how trust factors into the release of the footage. So every chief was asked various questions, these various scales that are used in the research regularly and tested regularly as to their various levels of trust. And we're gonna share with you just one of those scales related to citizen trust. So here's the, what we would think is one of our most interesting findings. If the video is circulating on social media already, so in the group where those police chiefs receive the two videos, the smartphone and the other one, and the smartphone was circulating on social media, trust is insignificant. It didn't matter at all. However, if there's only a BWC video, then trust is a significant predictor of a police chief's decision. So when we're comparing, should they release the footage immediately versus do not release the footage at all? The question for us was how influential is trust? Now keep in mind, this is only in scenarios where police chiefs have full control of whether or not a video is gonna be released. If a police chief trusts the residents in their community, they are 48% more likely to release the footage. 48% more likely to release the footage immediately as opposed to not releasing the footage if they trust the residents in their community. For us, this is a pretty important finding. Right? The implication here is that maybe body-worn cameras aren't necessarily what we need to be working towards, but trust is a factor that we really need to be thinking about. And that's not to say that people aren't thinking about trust, but to some degree, a body-worn camera implies just the opposite. 
right? It implies that we need to see what the other is doing because we don't trust that their action. And there are many reasons as to why that might be the case on both sides of the equation. But 48% more likely is a pretty, pretty large uh, finding there. Yeah, and we have a few questions that are asking about what you're saying right now. Sure. Um, so one is trust the community in what way? And the other is what do you mean by trust in the residents? Trust them to do something or react in a certain way? Yeah. Yeah, they're they're good questions. I don't have all I don't have the entire scale to share with you. Um, but essentially what we do, Etienne, what would you mind explaining the scale? Yeah. So scales, they're typical battle tested questions in research that are used again and again. So these try to cover as many aspects as possible of trust in residents in uh, determining policy, in being uh, fair judges of what you do, of being able to, you know, trying to rely on them to give you tips. All these kind of like think many dimensions of possible ways. And the tr like by memory, I think it was like six items, uh, different ways to like for police chiefs that they can say, yeah, I would mostly agree, agree, disagree on all these different elements. And we put them together to give us like one overall trust index uh, for, for residents. So it might say, you know, do you, uh, do you trust the residents in your community to perform a certain task? Uh, do, you, do you think the residents in your community evaluate policing fairly? Um, and it goes through a series of questions. Um, and we did this, we also did this for the police, their own organization, and we also did it for the media, which we're, we're not sharing right now. Um, so it's a series of questions, and then you're able to distill the level of trust from those questions. And Etienne and I didn't create these questions, right? These questions have been um, in the literature and tested time and time again to demonstrate that they actually do uh, give an indicator of trust. Yes. Does so, that answer again, that question, Jen? Yes. I think they were just looking for a little bit more information about what that, um, sure. you know, the trust meant there. Perfect. Sure. So that that's what we're kind of talking about with police chiefs. And um, a, a few other points we could just note before I jump to the citizen survey. Um, this was also the same as police chiefs trusted their officers. So, and I believe it was 68%. Um, so you replace that 48% more likely with 68%. If a police chief trusted his own officers or her own officers, the likelihood that they would release the footage increased dramatically. Um, so in both instances, when a, police off, when a police chief has full discretion to disclose the footage, trust played uh, a really monumental role. Yeah, and, one, and the last one was uh, trust in the media. And there the dynamic was a little bit different for police chiefs. Uh, so when they trusted the media, they didn't feel they had to release the information right away. They felt comfortable waiting after the internal investigation and they, didn't, they, they were not fearing that the media, and that scale, I remember it was like 16 items, like really, like really def like uh, specific. And then they were kind of okay. The media is not gonna do you know, an unfair job. They're not gonna speculate, they're gonna wait. And so if they, they were trusting the media, local media there, they were okay with waiting for the internal investigation. So there's different dynamics than the trust in their own officer and the trust in, in their citizen. Um, Okay, I'm going to now run through the, the citizen uh, residents, the U.S. resident survey, and I'll, I'll kind of hit on just a few of the key points that we, we looked at, uh, so it won't take that long, and then we'll, we're happy to open it up to Q&A um, and have a, a broader discussion. So as we said, we sent the survey to uh, U.S. residents in L.A., Charlotte, Seattle, and just a general sample of U.S. residents. Uh, we sent it to, we, we had responses of a thousand in each city. Um, and as Etienne explained earlier, each of these cities really represent uh, uh, the difference in policy implementation. So as a reminder, LA releases a stylized version of, uh, of the footage. They'll do a voiceover narration and they'll produce it a little bit more. 
Uh, Charlotte tends to not release footage uh, unless it is uh, done through a court order. And Seattle tends to be very transparent. Uh, you know, within 24, 48 hours, something along those lines, they will post it um, online. So these cities offer a range of policies related to the release of BWC footage. And this was the framing paragraph we gave to US residents. Um, and just to kind of break it down for you, essentially, we describe exactly what happened in that police stoppage that you saw in the BWC and smartphone uh, footage. However, in this, we had, we had broken this sample down into four different groups. And each group received something different. So. 40% were just given the BWC video. So they saw this, the police chief gave a, a press conference, and then the police chief released the video. That was given to 40% of our respondents. However, 20% were told that the perpetrator suffered from mental illness and out of uh, his family had requested that it not be released and that the, the, the law enforcement all, uh, was going to comply with that. They were gonna respect that decision. 20% were told that there was an internal investigation taking place. And once the investigation is complete, then they'll make a determination. And 20% were told the officer failed to activate his camera and therefore they were unable to release any footage. And essentially we're testing how these resonate with these different groups. And we're interested here into that second part, right? That transparency part of that original quote that I shared. Go ahead, Etienne. Yes. Yeah, so just to make sure, in this this one, it's not one video or two. It's one video for forty percent, or zero, no no video at all, just the explanation. And the for the sixty percent left. So the twenty twenty twenty, there are three different reasons why they'll never see, or maybe they have to wait, depending, for the video, but why they cannot see it right now. So it's not 50-50, it's 40-60. So 40% 40, 40 saw the video and 60% just had the, the description given that uh, you saw before. And what we said to them was, please indicate your level of agreement with the chief's handling of the body-worn camera footage. And every group, we received that. And this is what we saw. So this is the distribution of our results. And ultimately, while they were skewed somewhat differently, the median still falls in agreement with how the chief handled the footage. Yeah, so the way to read a box like this, so the big fat line in the middle, this is the median, this is like the when it's the normal solution, it's like the average. It's really like it's the middle of the pack. And when you see the top of the box and the bottom, this is the, the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile. So when you look, for example, in LA, no release, did not activate, you see that the, you know, the mean and the average, they're lower. And you see that the 25% is somewhat dissatisfied. Like it goes that low. And then there's some other ones there. But you can see that for across the four samples there in the US, Seattle, LA, and Charlotte, uh, the ones who cannot see it because it did not activate, uh, these people were not happy with how the, uh, the police chiefs handled the situation because they were, they were never going to see the video. There's no video to, to be seen. Uh, so, and when depending, there were some differences. People were not pleased where the reason why they couldn't see the video was for a mental health issue or because of the investigation pending. Uh, but when there's a general investigation, eventually they will see it. Mental health, some people, it, you know, it, they, it could convince them, okay, maybe there's a reason. But when they know that there was a camera and it didn't activate, uh, which happened in South Bend uh, a few years ago, uh, people are not pleased at all throughout the board. And, and the other thing that you notice here is that regardless of where people are, the results are, are pretty consistent. So, you know, often we think that local policies reflect the local populace. Um, but in this case, US in general and these three cities really all look very similar in their responses. 
We then asked them on a scale from zero to 10, with zero not being not transparent and 10 being extremely transparent, please rate the police department's level of transparency in disclosing information about this incident. And once again, you'll see pretty remarkable consistency. And as yeah, Etienne people, explained, that line. Yeah, and pe people are like, people actually see the video, the 40%. Uh, they find it much more transparent, obviously, than not seeing them. But we were interested, the three reasons for not seeing them, which one would be more palatable, more, more uh, understandable. Uh, and usually mental health is the one that's, okay, I'm not seeing it right now, but I can sort of understand why. But again, when it doesn't activate, uh, you know, this is something where uh, sometimes like the, the median or a, a significant, significant minority of citizens will be very distressed about. Um, but, so and you will you know, notice once again that the median still falls above that midpoint. Yes. Right. So in general, right, people are still suggesting that there is a level of transparency regardless of whether or not the footage is immediately displayed. Uh, this is interesting, right, in that right now we're hearing a lot of demand that we have to display the footage. And Which of the following statements best captures your opinions of how police departments should release footage? So this is kind of a throwback to that first question that we asked police chiefs and that all of you participated in and then answered. And I'll, I'm going to come back to this chart as our, our last slide. So I'll spend some more time on it then. But, yeah. but you can see a good chance. amount of people fall within the police department should release uh, raw footage of the encounter once an internal investigation is over. So this is a breakdown by race and ethnicity. So I'll give you guys a, a second to take a look at this. Etienne, do you want to jump in and kind of describe this a little bit? Yeah. So as we said before, overall, when we see, we see the the numbers that on the previous slide that were uh, representative of what you know of the composition of, of the the city in the U.S. at large, most I mean almost most people the the favorite option is to wait. They're okay to see the footage once the internal investigation is over. Uh, this is true overall, and maybe 20, 25% of them would rather, you know, when the, the other number would rather uh, see the, the rough footage uh, right away, uh, immediately. So that's this one right here, or this one here, right, yes. or release the raw footage. Yeah, but what, what we think is interesting is the last option, like the police department should release the raw footage immediately. This for people of color, way higher than for white people. So you'll see the discrepancy here. Essentially the same, same percent of people of color would prefer to see the footage released immediately as opposed to white or Caucasian people being willing to wait after an internal investigation. And that is consistent here, here and here, here and here. And that finding really looks quite different from anything else that we found throughout the rest of our results. And to really just drive that point home a little bit further, you'll see here where police chiefs are with the release of raw footage of the encounter after an internal investigation or the release of raw footage of the encounter immediately. Right, 48%, nearly half of them want to want to wait until after the internal investigation, right? Whereas only 12% are willing to uh, release the raw footage immediately. Well, look at these differences. If you're a person of color living within the United States, you believe that raw footage should be released immediately. And there's a, there's a major discrepancy there between that 12% of those police chiefs and the 40%. However, if you're white and living within the United States, you actually look, your responses are actually quite similar to the police chiefs. So when we're looking at these divides and we're trying to understand some of these barriers, 
these factors are really important for us to consider. And the wants and desires and needs of people look different depending on how they view this situation and what their relationship is with law enforcement in their community. So we're hopeful that this is, this is helpful in further understanding this. So the qualitative study that I talked about, you guys will just have to buy the book. Uh, because we, oh, that's uh, the best part, which is too bad. Because the police chiefs there, they really share. We ask them to explain like how it changed the way they're policing, the relationship with the community, their officers, and they dish it out. It's amazing. Um, so that's a good preview for everyone. Um, we're happy to answer questions and and discuss uh, you know some of the findings we had from our qualitative study. Um, but obviously, much much uh, longer format and and take uh, a bit longer to go through. Um, you know, Etienne and I are both uh, scholars of, of public administration, which means that we study, um, you know, we study how, how policies are implemented, how citizens react to those policies, how um, career officials try to implement and address some of those concerns of residents. Um, you know, so for us, this, this doesn't work unless there's something uh, that is applicable at the end of it. So we hope that, you know, with our research that, that we, we do have some findings that are applicable and that we understand that a trust is, um, you know, a really important factor here. And that while body-worn cameras are certainly a component of this equation, um, without that trusting relationship, uh, we're, we're going to really still have uh, a number of challenges to face uh, with law enforcement and their community members. Um, and with that, we're, we're happy to open it up and take some questions from all of you. All right, yes, questions are definitely coming in. So let me just look here. So the first one is, did you control for jurisdictions, agencies that have personnel investigation restrictions included in collective bargaining agreements? That would be an important thing to control for in that question as to what the response is to the public regarding the use of footage. Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. Um, so the way, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of answer that in a, a couple different ways, and then Etienne will probably correct me and answer it in a, a third way. Um, so first, um, you know, the, the research kind of response is um, the experiments are completely random. So in both of those groups, there are the same exact uh, number of, of jurisdictions that would have those, you know, union restrictions versus the ones that would not have those union restrictions. Um, so in theory, it shouldn't, it shouldn't really matter. They should balance each other out. And, you know, that, that, that's kind of our, you know, methodological response. Um, you know, the, the more practical response and how we tried to get around that, and obviously, you know, you got to take it with a grain of salt, right? I mean, it is what it is, um, is we tried to position it so it wasn't based on their own policies. And we tried to position it as a pilot project of the other department. Um, and we wanted them to give feedback to their colleague. Um, and that is very, you know, purposeful as to why we did not ask them to talk about their own policies. Um, so those are the, th those are my, my two responses. Um, but no question, it's a really important point. Okay, so the next question is, how much are they, and I assume this means the police chiefs, allowed to edit the video footage before it is released to the public? I mean, how much are they allowed to edit it? Is that the question? Yeah, I guess maybe they're asking how their laws or is there standards? It, it really depends on where you are. Um, you know, there there's certainly certain disclosure laws, and you know, I'm sure there are some attorneys on this that that probably could answer that even better than than I can. Um, uh, you know, it depends on on the jurisdiction that you're in. Um, you know, and there are different there are different ways to edit that footage, right? So there may be, uh, you know, most videos, if not all videos, are first going through privacy checks. Um, so do they need to blur out any faces? Um, you know, are there, are, is there anyone underage captured on that? Is there anyone that um, could have some harm, you know, caused to them because they're on the video? You know, any number of questions like that and, and adjustments are, are made there. Um, 
So, so there are any number of different edits that may take place. Um, I'm not aware of any guiding, you know, law that would say you cannot edit uh, a video whatsoever. Um, sometimes these do end up in court and a judge might order a specific uh, type of edit uh, for the protection of an individual. Okay, so the next question is, let's see, what do you feel like comes into play in a situation like Portland where these mysterious police come in um, from the federal government and there's no chance of seeing any footage? I guess it's more saying, is there no chance of seeing any footage? Um, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I wouldn't want to claim to know too much. I mean, and at the end, please feel free to jump in. I mean, um, you know, my understanding um, is that, you know, those federal, I, I, I really can't comment on that too much, yeah, I don't the, think. These federal, age, many times now their discussion to, for the longest time, federal agents could not have body-worn cameras. And there were some issues if they were doing a joint operation with, let's say, state troopers, where state troopers would have them, but the federal agents are not supposed to be filmed and they're not having them. So what do we do? There were questions like this. I, I know there were discussions now to start maybe letting some of them in certain restricted um, uh, circumstances have them, but usually federal agents did not need to, to have them. Yeah, and that is changing, right? I mean, that has changed um, certainly since the George Floyd incident where federal officers are now wearing body-worn cameras. Whether or not yeah. um, we would see those, I, I don't yeah. know. But e even in the, uh, the local level and sometimes, you know, county level or state level, you know, again, it changes. It's all over the map, like the different variations of, of policies there. But many times uh, SWAT teams would not have them. And the thinking is we don't want someone asking to see the videos and then know how SWAT teams uh, operate because there will be some people probably in their basement that will pour over them and make sure to know the way it's going to happen if they're planning something bad when they might encounter them. Uh, and we know like in, in, in Weeville, what happened was, was there was a raid like this. So they were, they had cameras there. It was on the SWAT team, but when it's SWAT teams and sometimes mistake happen then, they're not all, sometimes local uh, uh, policies would say, everyone needs to have a camera, but SWAT teams don't. Or like, inter, I mean, internal affairs, sometimes they, you know, they don't. Or obviously people that are, uh, I'm looking for my words in English right now, pretending to be bad guys, like undercover, it's going to be very suspicious if you have a camera, like you don't have to do it to have them. Uh, but usually the federal level, I'm, I don't think you would see them. All right, so the next question is a little long, so let me see if I can um, get through it. But it says that the listener has a major concern with video and audio um, and that body-worn cameras often sketchy and catching important details or body language and that bystander video also can be the same way. Um, how is one to know that bystander footage isn't edited before being released to the press? It would be naive to think people don't have an agenda when releasing bystander footage to the press. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a fair point. I mean, the, I'll, I'll give you kind of a, a couple of interesting um, tidbits kind of related to that. Um, a, the, the gentleman that, um, provided those videos to us. Um, he's done a number of uh, uh, different uh, projects related to videos. Um, but one of them is, is the idea of camera bias. Um, so when a camera is positioned, say in the corner of a room and captures the footage, um, people will perceive that differently than if the same exact footage is captured on the chest of a police officer from a body-worn camera. Uh, they'll believe the officer should have acted acted differently depending on the view of the camera. So regardless if the, the smartphone video is edited or not, um, there are different perspectives and they're gonna draw out different um, responses from, from people. Um, so we know that that happens. Uh, the other kind of interesting thing that's happening and um, Etienne, you might be able to speak to this a little more than I am, uh, Axon, which is one of the largest providers of body-worn cameras, they now have a citizen portal. Um, and essentially what you do is you then turn, you turn that smartphone uh, footage into the citizen portal. Um, so they keep record of that as well. And obviously there are, you know, positives and negatives related to that. 
um, but that would that would you know that would help um, uh, stop any editing of that that footage. Wow, that's interesting. Um, are there certain areas of the country that are more likely to release body cam footage, in your knowledge, um, like North, South, Midwest, et cetera? Mm, I, 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 I don't, um, I don't think so. Um, but I'm, I, I, I can't say for sure. You know, I, I kind of have to, you know, I tend to look, look at that map pretty regularly and, and go through those policies and they, they change frequently. I think as the, um, the first question, um, the first uh, participant asked about the unions um, related to body worn cameras, um, that tends to be something that is popping up um, a good amount, right? So union contracts, personnel contracts will often stipulate uh, that cameras are part of personnel files, um, which is the case in North Carolina. Uh, personnel files are not always accessible. They're typically not accessible through freedom of information requests. Uh, so that's a tactic that, that allows uh, uh, law enforcement agencies not to disclose some of that footage. Um, often you'll, you'll see um, footage can't uh, be randomly audited either, right? So only if there has been a use of force incident or a citizen complaint uh, could that footage be accessed. So for example, if uh, smoking a cigarette in a, a cruiser is, um, you know, against law enforcement policy and the camera picks up an officer smoking a cigarette, that's not something that you would actually be able to do anything with, right? You're not going to say that you're, you're against uh, department policy because you did that. Um, so there, there are certainly restrictions, and, and the truth is they're all over the place across the country. Um, the next question is, what was the most surprising result to you? To uh, for me, me and yeah, go ahead, Atim. Yeah, and again, I, I lived in the U.S. I mean, you can't hear it right now with my Jersey accent, but I lived in the U.S. for years. Uh, and to me, like, the United States, they have this, you know, it's a strong, strong tradition to have state rule, local preferences, federal government, you know, sometimes tell us what to do, but it's all about what we want and you know, we experiment and we don't wanna to be told how to do our things. Uh, so these different policies, we thought maybe they would reflect local preferences. Uh, and especially like the last table there where we, we showed you like police chiefs, uh, you know, white people and uh, people of color. Look at the numbers, like let's say like, uh, not reason for the 10.7, 10.8, 10.9, 8. These are really close numbers. Like, and, and you look at them and they're really, really similar. You know, a few percentage points here and there, they're really similar. Uh, and I didn't know there was such a consensus in the US for preferences of how, when and how to see the footage. I thought there'd be really big variation. And that the you know police chiefs in LA or Seattle and Charles they they know what their you know that their population want and somehow through politicians and you know they, they got or maybe sheriffs around them like they got an idea this is what our citizens know and we had one police chiefs early on in another project that really took the time after the study to write us a really thoughtful email it was saying uh, policing is done exactly there's so many checks and you know we have to be attuned to you know preferences citizens get the policing they want this is whatever they you know they, they they get this is what they want because we live in a democracy and you know it was very well explained uh and maybe you know his it was him his department did it this way but for the cities we tested when we we uh surveyed their citizen this is not what we found so this to me like really surprised me but again you know i'm i'm, I'm not american no it's it's a really good point right so the consistency across the United States was was pretty remarkable. Um, obviously, the the data related to uh, people of color versus white people um, was striking, and I think a pretty important finding. Um, we didn't share the qualitative survey, uh, you know, information with you, but essentially these were paragraphs that police chiefs wrote for us, sometimes longer than that. I mean, we basically asked them how body worn cameras have have affected their relationships with the community and their relationships with their officers, um, and more often than not. Uh, the body-worn camera uh, is being used to dismiss citizen complaints. That was, that was by far the most common response from police chiefs, that they use them to 
uh, basically dismiss citizen complaints um, in a relatively efficient manner. So that to me was surprising in that law enforcement uses body-worn cameras to hold citizens accountable. Citizens believe, or US residents believe that they're using body-worn cameras to hold police accountable. Um, this, this indicates that there might be a problem, but it also suggests that there could be progress made in that in that conversation, whatever happens between that, you know, that police chief, and we had police chiefs say, I'll pick up the phone and call a citizen and say, hey, are you sure I have the footage? In that conversation, I think progress can be made. Um, so for me, that was a, a pretty striking finding. This is kind of, this next question kind of plays off of that. Um, and were the police chiefs open to these kind of discussions or did you feel like they were guarded? No, I thought they were completely open. Um, you know, to the extent, I mean, I, I had police chiefs calling me, um, you know, almost when we, when we first put the survey out, this was, this was you know, uh, February-ish, right? Uh, January, February, I think somewhere along there. So prior to the most recent incidents, but certainly not prior to, you know, many of the things that happened over the last five years, um, I had police chiefs calling me and, and discussing this. Uh, the qualitative responses we received uh, were thoughtful, long format responses. Um, they definitely engaged. You know, we ended up with, so we, we showed you all results from 700. We have another, you know, uh, 500 results from the qualitative uh, study that we did from a different set of, of police chiefs. Um, so, you know, in, in, in research like this, while it may not seem like a great response rate, it, it's a pretty good response rate to get, you know, 10% of your um, respondents in a very specific, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, job with a lot of responsibility, a lot of time spent working to respond to surveys like this. So, so yes, I, I would say that they were engaged. All right, we have one final question here. Um, do you think the rise of iPhone camera footage and people taking those videos is based on the distrust by people of color that body cam footage will ever make it out? Or is it just based on more people have iPhones and cameras now? Um, I, you know, I'd be speculating. Um, yeah, but there's, there's, some, there's a dynamic that is, to me, is interesting. So what happened with Michael Brown uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, and the biggest city next to it, help me, Dan. Uh, where Where are you? In Missouri. I'm having I'm having uh, my, okay. my Missouri and geography there. So the the biggest city next to it, after all these years, they still don't have body cams. So and even if you have them in Minnesota, uh, there was footage, and it took many months to see it. In Weaville right now, there is footage. There was something released today after the fact, but during the fact, we have, like, there is footage existing and we don't have it. So just because it was filmed doesn't mean automatically everywhere that uh, the footage will be seen. And if the footage is not shared eventually, I mean, it's one thing to wait for the internal investigation, but if you don't see it, uh, then these promises of transparency, accountability are harder to, to get behind. If there's footage that is not shared with the public, uh, then it can be, you know, it can be used to hold citizens to account. But it's if, if the public never see it, it's harder for citizens to hold police officers in account in the rare cases where something really bad happens. Yeah, there, there, there's an assumption that transparency leads to accountability, and and that's a, a you know possibly a false assumption, and if 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 anything, it's certainly an unproven assumption. Um, Transparency doesn't necessarily lead to accountability, nor does transparency lead to trust. Um, you know, so whether or not people are filming because they don't trust, sure, I think that, 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 uh, that's potentially the case. Um, that said, you know, law enforcement are also filming. Um, you know, and, and, you know, once again, what I, what I would point to is that we really shouldn't be um, catering towards surveillance. Um, we should be trying to create trust within our communities and investing in trust within our communities. And that's a much longer, harder road uh, to go down. 
Um, and that's not to say that body-worn cameras shouldn't be used. I think that they can be a tool that can be effective, um, but there's clearly much harder work that needs to happen um, within, within certain communities. All right, that was the last question. I feel like that was a good way to end as well. That was some interesting information. So um, we are gonna wrap this up. I did wanna let you know that we will send out a follow-up email uh, that will have some more details and some resources that we can provide for you to kind of dive deeper into this if you want. And it will also be listed in our webinar library if you feel like there's anybody else that would be interested in watching. We will have that up in a couple of days and I will send along the link to that as well if you wanna share it with people. So thank you so much to both of you. Um, we'll have to have you back after the book is out so you can share the rest of that information, but this was great. Thank you so much. Sure, thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye everyone, thanks.